evening friends welcome to the first of the update 2021 session the speaker is a dear friend dr sanjay agarwala i know him from my medical college days so i can say confidently that i know him for about 50 years sanjay was one year junior to me at mbbs level but then that one year he compensated very well in knowledge he has been with hinduja hospital from the time hinduja hospital started so you know in 1985 when the concept of full timer came and we were wondering how people will become full timer because indian doctors are used to running around from hospital to nursing home to polyclinic sanjay took the plunge and i am sure he is not regretted 35 years today director of surgery and director of professional services at hinduja hospital he has lot of feathers under his crown i will not take too much time describing all of them but he is a wonderful surgeon and you won't believe like sanjay i am sorry i am not buttering you but the kind of service sanjay gives us no is unheard of i'll give you a case it is a sunday a patient of mine falls down in the bathroom the doctor in law on the instruction sends me a photograph it's a classical hip fracture the patient has one limb turned outwards and shorter than the other i call sanjay sanjay where are you i am not in bombay and what has happened i have this patient he just said give me the patient's number and he gave it to his registrar they coordinated and the patient got a call from sanjay's team an ambulance was sent patient was shifted and next morning the patient was operated when sanjay came back and i got a bottle of single malt whiskey because the patient was so grateful so you know this is these are the small things that sanjay does which makes him different than other orthopedic surgeons or other friends that i have smallest things like i tell him patient is reaching here in a ambulance and the casualty they are waiting for that patient so i think sanjay you taken medical practice to a different level and i am happy to be associated with you so i hand over sanjay agarwala to you for giving you insights into what are the recent developments in knee and hip replacement you are at liberty to ask question today i will be moderating the questions so i will pick up the questions and i will ask sanjay at the end of the thing sanjay over to you thank you i hope you can hear me and see me great yeah, you, of course we can so chandar you are a great friend and that's why you said all the right thing that i'm delighted by that all of it i hope is true and uh, it's been great being associated with dr asrani for many many years in a medical college he was our cultural secretary very well known very well loved by all of us and this association has continued since then and yeah and chandra is absolutely right i have known him for 50 years i came back to india and joined hinduja hospital 35 years ago i joined as a consultant in orthopedics and now i am the medical director which shows that the full time system works it works very well i am reasonably known some of you may have interacted with me seen me talked to me sent your patients and i hope all your patients did well so that's what we are here for we are consultants who consult and do surgery and hope that our patients do very well over a period of time this uh, request from chandar came sanjay can you talk about new things in hips and knees and i realized of course i mean there's so many things which are new i could bore you with lectures that i give my orthopedic colleagues from time to time i've been president of the society and so on and so forth 
but those would be very technical. I recognize that most of you have a general practice where things like the story that Chandra just mentioned matter. So let me take you through the process. Let's understand what I'm talking about. And then I'd be delighted to field your questions thereafter. From time to time, if required, Chandra can nudge me and we can repeat a slide. That's not a problem. And if required at the end also, I could come back to some of my slides. So Chandra, shall I start a share screen? Sure, sure. We'll do that. So there we are. <clears throat> this is what I was asked to talk about. And yes, I am also at Bridge Candy. And some people have been phoning me. A lot of patients have been, people have been phoning me. Dr. Udwadia, who I operated yesterday, is walking. All right. So that's aside. So you won't believe it, Ras uh, Dr. Asrani. I've had at least 50 phone calls from people, some who I didn't know also, asking ki kya hua, et cetera. Well, I operated him yesterday. He's walking. Yesterday he was walking. And today he's even better still. So that is a fact. I will go on and I operated him at Beach Candy because that was close to his residence. So I will now take you through what we decided we would do. Okay, where is it not moving? Mm -hmm. One moment. There we are. Yeah, the, the, so the nation wants to know what's new in orthopedics. So let's start with what is arthritis. Well, arthritis is, like you can see on the screen, joint and inflammation. So when you get arthritis, it can be due to various types. It can be osteoarthritis, rheumatoid, gout, psoriatic, ankylosing, collagen disease, and so on and so forth. So all these kinds of arthritis, ultimately you will see the patient and probably I would think take an X-ray. Now, if you see the first X-ray that I have put on your screen on the left-hand side, bilateral knees standing. Is that important? We will come to that in a few minutes. Lateral, you can see the laterals, you can see changes, which I will point out since you all are practitioners. Now, when you look at this, on the right side, when the person is standing, the joint space here, is my cursor visible? Dr. Asrani? Yeah, yeah, visible, visible. Okay. So because the patient is loading the leg, this curse, this area is loaded, and there is therefore obvious evidence that there is no cartilage. The bone is kissing bone. If you look at the left side, which was probably less symptomatic, there is space here. So this is probably less symptomatic. So you will notice this on the first x-ray that I'm showing you. If you look more closely, you will see an osteophyte here. The osteophyte suggests that this has been a chronic process and there is bone reaction to this wearing out of the bone. If you look at the lateral, a few things I'd like to show you. If you look at the patella, you can see that there is osteophytes of the patella. So this patient clearly also has osteoarthritis of the patellofemoral joint. Possibly as a result of the wear and tear, there are tiny pieces and particles which may or may not be loose bodies. But if you notice them, it helps in your management. Clearly, if there are loose bodies, they keep coming in the way. And this is a problem. If you look at that over here, now let me just take this away. In the patella, you will notice the osteophytes are more accentuated, very well seen. And even though you have osteophytes here on, in the middle screen, they are not well seen because they are above and below. Here, you can see the patella side to side. And this is the difference between non-weight bearing x-rays, what I just showed you in the first slide, in the earlier slide. And here, when you are weight bearing, you will see how this has collapsed. So clearly, if a patient presented to me with this x-ray and you just flashed me an x-ray on a WhatsApp, just like uh, Dr. Asrani told you, I would be 
perhaps not incorrect to say ki zyada kharabi to nahi lag rahi hai but whereas if i had this standing x ray which clearly shows that this is bone against bone and there are osteophytes clearly that would say that this patient had significant severe arthritic pain we also ask for a scanogram nowadays and why a scanogram a scanogram is done in most places that have digital x rays essentially they take three pictures one of the hip one of the thigh with the knee and one of the thigh without uh, with the leg below this is an advance on what i just showed you which was just standing weight bearing x rays here you will see how you can see the alignment of the hip the knee and the ankle and clearly what should normally be the case is that the center of the hip should come straight down to the center of the knee we should come straight down to the center of the ankle in this case the center of the hip which is sort of visible with this line comes down to the center of the knee so the hip and the knee reasonably aligned but the hip and the ankle clearly are not well aligned there is a bowing effectively this patient has a varus so that was in the first x ray a varus is really very well seen on this particular scanogram and also because the scanogram is done standing you will also notice what we discussed earlier that the joint space is eroded and there is bone on bone clearly this is even a worse case than that because it's not only that the medial joint line is eroded but there is actually a depression of the joint line so this is a severe case and whereas this one you can make out even as practitioners busy in your work that this is a valgus knee and therefore this is the different condition what would then be the steps of treatment of course i'm a surgeon i do joint replacements i do joint replacements for a living but are there measures that you as practitioners can also undertake and clearly these have to be medicines there could be non medicine things before you send them for surgery to one of us surgical consultants now it seems illogical to talk in such an erudite meeting that weight reduction is a requirement so the reason i'm pointing this out is that this is common sense you just saw how weight bearing x rays are impacted by the fact that you are weight bearing clearly if you are loading the same knee with more weight if i was to tell one of these patients that this is the 20 kilo bag that you are allowed to take on a flight please keep it on the top of your head and do not put it on the floor the very same knees that i'm showing you on this x ray would get more loaded and more painful so if a patient is 20 kilos more than his body frame permits then that patient will definitely have more symptoms leave aside that surgery etc is an issue why should you suggest to him before he he may he or she may decide that they don't want surgery all well can they therefore other than weight reduction which is difficult i mean i have been through it i can see chandar and i have both been through this trying very hard to lose weight difficult but can they offload the knee or the hip of course they can if they use a cane or a stick a lot of patients don't want to do it but that is one very good way of offloading the knee again coming back to this you can imagine if one of these patients was using a stick they would be able to offload that painful part of the knee like here and therefore they would be more comfortable and they could seek time before they need surgery exercises now i'm sure all of you tell them that you do 10000 steps i tell myself i must do 10000 steps sometimes it is difficult but there are some exercises like the land based exercises aquatic exercises all very well for me to prescribe it i mean who has 
swimming abilities and who has access to a swimming pool. Very few people. But certainly that is something to be considered. Tai Chi, I will talk about a little later again. And multimodal physical therapy. Physical therapy is therapy which is done by someone like a physiotherapist. If you do it yourself, it becomes an exercise. If you do certain types of exercises like coordination exercise, they become Tai Chi. If you do your exercises inside a swimming pool, well, that becomes an aquatic exercise. When you do physical therapy, other than these exercises, there are modalities of heat, of ice, of ultrasound, of laser, which also help decrease the pain. And clearly self-management education programs teach patients about their condition so they can buy time and be more comfortable. And we talked about heat, we talked about ultrasound, acupuncture helps because some patients do respond very well to it, others don't. And nerve stimulation, transcutaneous nerve stimulation also ameliorates the pain. Weight reduction of even 1% makes a difference and you've seen that in your practice. Sanjay, I am interrupting you. But I am. Aapka voice thoda echo ho rahe aur thoda jada chahiye. Okay. Let me take this off. Yeah. And speak here. Is this better? Yeah, this is better. I will use that. Yeah. Okay. Weight reduction of even 1% reduces symptoms. It improves the quality of life. You've seen this in your practice. You have fat patients come to you with blood pressure and diabetes. They lose weight, their hypertension comes down. They lose weight and their blood pressure improves. Uh, their, their diabetes improves. The same thing happens when you do weight reduction with osteoarthritis of the lower limbs. Now this, how much weight reduction and so on, are features that you will be able to get from the internet or from a textbook, but it definitely, weight loss improves pain and decreases your disability. Nutritional education is the mainstay of weight reduction. Patients have to recognize that they need to do this. Low energy diet, meaning low carbs and low fats, unless you go for the fat diet, which is a different thing altogether. Exercises is double-edged. Exercises help, but exercises to make you lose weight, let me put it in perspective. 7,500 calories is one kilo. You tell patients ki 10,000 steps karne and nowadays, you know, with the apps which are available on the phone, free apps, patients can actually have a pedometer on their, on their phone. And 10,000 steps is 300 calories. Now look at 10,000 steps, 300 calories. If you are able to do 10,000 steps and not do anything about your diet, it'll take a long time for you to lose one kilo of weight. 7,500 calories is one kilo of weight. But on the other hand, if you were to have nutritional education, it's possible for you to lose weight. And there are lots of diets. I mean, whether you, you send them to a dietitian, which is an excellent thing to do, or even if they were to do a chalu diet, which is on the internet, like the GM diet, it works. But it works for a short period of time. Second thing I would request you all to look at is intermittent starvation, intermittent, diet, uh, intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is a great way of initiating this weight loss, at least for the first four to six weeks. And then the body starts adapting to it. But that, these are some of the ways that you need to do to lose weight. Is obesity a contraindication for a successful total knee? Well, the answer is that if you have morbid obesity, that is a bad thing. But we have published our work in JCOT that Obesity itself is not a contraindication. 
and fat people can get very successful surgery. Physical exercises increases muscle strength, the range of motion, the aerobic capacity and endurance. These are common sense things, but really something that we need to encourage people to do. And no specific type of exercise regimen has been shown to be superior. So, a fact of the matter is, if you look at these two bones, the humerus, and these are two cross sections, you will notice that here it is of a certain dimension, whereas here is a thicker amount of cortical bone. Agar niche dekhe aap log non throwing and throwing. So this is the humerus which is the throwing humerus, the one that this particular patient has used more. The hand or the arm or the bone which has been more exercised against resistance has thicker quality bone which is good for the patient. So coming to this fact that physical exercises not only increases muscle strength and so on, it also improves the quality of bone. The converse to this is disuse atrophy. If a person has pain, then his bones may become more like this over a period of time. And we've seen this time and again in hips and knees. Hydrotherapy that we talked about, aqua therapy, hydrotherapy in the swimming pool, it reduces the stress to the joints due to the buoyancy. It's like you're doing exercises on Mars. It's better tolerated and they don't really need to have the ability to swim. They can walk in the pool. It's totally well for them to be able to do that. But these exercises help. We are Indians. We believe in yoga. It's a good thing for stretching rather than strengthening the muscles. It's a great thing for stretching rather than strengthening. And now a lot of yoga teachers have adapted yoga to make it a little bit of more exercise regimen, which is great. It connects the body, it connects the health and the mind, which we recognize as breathing and so on. So it's good for you. But it is not the greatest thing to build up muscle. And that's maybe why Baba Ramdev is thin, maybe. Tai Chi, on the other hand, which is Chinese, so we don't like Chinese things nowadays. But Tai Chi, on the other hand, are slow, fluid movements and it improves coordination. Now, when you come to a certain age, now, for Chandar and me, anything who is older than us is old, anyone younger than us is younger. It improves the coordination. And if you have better coordination, there's less chance of falling. So exercises like Tai Chi, even dancing, these are great to prevent people from falling, but these will not necessarily build up muscles. Just like I said, yoga doesn't necessarily build up muscles unless you do resisted movements. Pharmacological is common sense. You have NSAIDs and standard ones that you and I use. I use the same ones that you use. I mean, the combiflams, the Wolverans, etc. There are opioids that work. We all have tried Ultraset for our patients. Don't give a patient who's going to Dubai Ultraset because he can go behind bars. Nutritional supplements to improve the strength of muscles, having more proteins, and local injections of corticosteroids and visco supplementation. I'll talk about in a minute. So if you have an inflammation which is painful, so you have a lady who has got her daughter's wedding in three weeks time, very painful knees, she says she can't walk. Corticosteroid injection will buy her time because all the inflammatory parts which are not getting controlled with the standard tablets that you and I have been giving can get diminished so that she's more comfortable. However, Repeated injections are definitely not recommended. It does cause cartilage damage because that's what steroids do. And you can get steroid arthropathy. Leave aside the fact that if you don't do it properly or you don't do it in sterile conditions, you can in inflict an infection. 
Hyaluronic acid, you all have probably heard of and thought about, and you have had uh, pharmaceutical agents visit you, suggesting ki dalwado aap. It can give, in early stages, pain relief. It does restore lubrication. It has a little biological effect. However, all of these hyaluronic acids are not the same. I have slides to talk about this in half a minute. The idea of the hyaluronic acid is that it restores lubrication. These are cells which are all interlinked, but if they're just interlinked as a chain and they are thin, they get absorbed very fast. But these are the ones which are made in India, made in China and are cheaper. They don't work more than a week or two or three. If you want them to work, they need to be highly cross-linked. They have to have the right composition. It should be almost like healthy young synovial fluid. Source of production matters and the ones that I'm talking about, they all come from cock comb. The comb of cock is used to produce this. And some of, sometimes it works and early stages it works well. I am not an agent for Synvisc, but this is the only one that really works. And I myself have used it, but I do not give it freely. I don't offer it to patients. A, the patients who come to me come late. B, the ones who come to me early, we have, we have other things to give them. And the ones that come late, definitely they come to me for surgery, which is the right thing to do at that point in time. So all of them are not the same. This one is the closest. This, I just met the agent today. It costs 21,000 rupees as the MRP. Whereas the others you get for three, four, five thousand. But they don't work. It just buys you time that the patient bichara thinks. That, well, you're doing something for it. <laughs> so, thank you very much. All All right, of you are feeling uh, much better now. So we have people who've taken it. They feel better. But I'm not recommending this across the board. You will have heard of a condition called avascular necrosis and in your lifetime, in general practice, you should probably be seeing one a year unless you're missing it. It affects young patients. They have pain and difficulty in walking. It's a debilitating condition. It requires surgery. And this is what you see on the MRI and on the x-rays that you get edema, you get osteolytic areas and you can even get a collapse. Can surgery be avoided? And that's something that we've really worked on for many years, 25 years, with publications in really reputable journals worldwide. <laughs> so for those of you who don't recognize us, <laughs> that's Helen. That's what she looks like nowadays. And we have medications for this. As I said, I've published this in various journals. Look at these journals, Rheumatology, uh, JBJS, Journal of Arthroplasty, etc. It works. And this is what I published in the Journal of Global Oncology in 2018. Let me take you through this. Dr. Banavli was my co-author. And I use bisphosphonates for these conditions. You may have heard of bisphosphonates. You may have used these bisphosphonates you would have used these for osteoporosis. I use this even to treat the softening of the bone that I showed you here. The softening of the bone that I showed you here. And here, I use it successfully. <coughs> we have to give them calcium and vitamin D. And you can see these changes. Look at this, look at this, and look at this. Look at the MRI, edema, this and this. And this is at the end of three to four years, the patient is able to do everything without surgery. Now, I'm a surgeon. I need to do surgery. It's professionally my, my vocation. But these are patients who have done well without surgery by management of the bisphosphonate therapy, which is there on the internet. You write Agarwala, AVN, and bisphosphonate, you'll get it. In stage 2 cases, likewise, you can see how this patient is doing extremely well. 
another case patient has stage 2 on one side has stage 3 on the other side with a collapse doing extremely well with medical treatment aur ab main khelne jata hu cricket khelne jata hu football khelne jata hu volleyball khelne jata hu daudta hu bhagta hu So this was the young man who had leukemia as a result of which ALL as a result of which he had AVN and can you imagine someone so young being given surgery as an option and this is what he said you heard him he is doing everything that his brother does he can play cricket he can run along and do the same activities as his brother so there is a medical line of treatment and kind of thing that i would recommend you all to also do which is what you all are doing day in and day out you all are giving medicines to patients and when that doesn't work then you need to get them to a surgeon so i met you before i became an actor when i had broken my leg then i met you again when i became an actor when i broke my back and now, and now you're a star now you so there are things that we do without the need for surgery we give them medicines However there comes a time when you then need to give to surgery clearly when deciding for surgery you talk about the alternatives which i talked about earlier you talk about the benefits you have to talk to them about the risks and these are the very questions that your patients will ask you what is the procedure called how is it done results return to normal activity and this is where i take off now to take you through this journey there is arthroscopic debridement there is for knees there is high tibial osteotomy unicondylar and total knee replacement it's no for normally aligned knees with mild oa if there is a displaced meniscus tear then you take away the tear so these are little early stages which would be helped by doing an arthroscopic debridement in late stages it does not work the reason i have selected this particular slide is if you notice that there is a button here a button here and a button here so i have not switched patients this is a patient who came to me at the age of 16 who had only this deformity which i was talking about which is seen on standing x rays otherwise very fit and active had had an acl repair done earlier and now came to me for a total knee replacement or a unicondylar i genuinely felt that i could do him a greater service by doing an osteotomy where this varus knee i could correct and do a better alignment I did this open wedge osteotomy and here you can see how few months after the osteotomy you can see the cut in the bone the cut has filled in this and even the alignment is good it's the same patient same button here here and here and we we have over a period of years published this in various journals 2008 2016 and there are more and patients properly selected do extremely well and this retains their joint if you go to your dentist he says ki ukhad denge naya dant laga denge are you happy with that or are you happy with someone who suggests to you that he can do a root canal he can do a filling he can give you a cap i think all of us are so i take all my patients in the same light what would i be more comfortable with under these circumstances and then i am in a position to offer it the deformity has to be less than 15 degrees if this varus was 20 degrees and all a little unlikely that it would work we do offer unicondylars and yet another case where you can see that this is bone against bone when the patient is standing we did this unicondylar and the patient did extremely well after that however very often i see patients who've got advanced disease of the other compartments like that of the patella like that of the lateral compartment Now those patients they will not benefit from one of the three compartments being replaced so this is a delicate 
uh, decision. And that's the decision that maybe people like yourself will send your patients to people like me so that that decision can be taken of whether this patient needs... Aishwarya, let me ask you a question. Are you, are you happy with the treatment you so, got here? What does it look like? Well, we hope all of them feel good after coming and meeting us, after they've met you and they've met me. We do hips, we do knees. And let me take you through this journey of hips and knees and what's new. Indian patients, and I frankly I think this should be around the whole world, they have expectations of extreme range of motions they want. They have active lifestyles with high demands. They want to get well and walking today. If they are operated in the morning, they need to be able to walk today. And they want longevity of their implant. Yes. I mean, they, once they've had it done, they don't want to come back to you after three years to get it redone. We'll go through all of these with you in just a moment. How much flexion is desired? And Well, if you were a dancer, you would want this, clearly. But we live in Asia. We have cultural and religious activities which require full flexion. When I started, I started doing hips and knees. This was in England 30, 40 years ago. That's where I went for training. I was there five years. And we used to tell all our patients that this you will need to sit on the chair. You have to use an Indian commode, uh, sorry, a Western commode. You can drive a car, but don't have a low seat, etc. And I'm sure all of you have had these kind of questions being told to you by your patients and by your uh, colleagues. If you need to rise from stairs, you need to be able to get this range of movement. This is possible by most surgical procedures. If you want to tie your shoelace, you need this degree of movement. If you're sitting like this, you need lots of movement. If you want to do this, like this little bachu and his father, well, you need this range of movement. The question that was always asked in earlier times is, is this possible after a hip or knee replacement? That was not possible with standard knee replacements, but with high flex, it is possible to get so much range of movement. And this is the kind of knee I offer 99% of my patients. What is new? Well, not only the technique, but even the implant. It has structural changes to the shape which allow for deep flexion. It has a chamfered anterior post which gives it the stability even in deep flexion. And you give a little slope here. It's got seven degrees posterior tibial slope. So this is one of the designs which affords this and this is the one I use all the time. Made by, this particular one is made by Smith and Nephew but they're matching ones which are made by Zimmer and by Max and by Johnson & Johnson Dupuy. So the earlier generations would not permit you to do things like this. This is the magic that some of us consultants are able to offer your patients. The normal joint function after replacement. Patient with total knee, the arrow is showing you the scar of surgery, so it's not that I've just picked up a person and said, bed jao aise. That's the kind of knees I give and do. And let's look through this. This is after a knee replacement. It's pretty fair. She can use an Indian commode if she wants. She can use it. Now look at this. So this is the kind of thing that is new since you, uh, Dr. Aswani asked me to show what is new. This is the kind of thing that is new that I have to offer and this is the kind of thing that is new in the world. Everyone may not do this. They may have reasons not to do it but this is what I can offer you 
And this is what is new because of what we saw here. These are some of the joints. And now all these joints, each one of these, the price is regulated by the government. So it's not that if I use this joint, it's more expensive for the patient. It's the same price. Can complex knees also be replaced? Of course they can be. And we've seen this time and time again. These patients have been suffering, and once they get a knee replacement, they do extremely well and they're back to normal activities. Sometimes, now we started off this whole lecture with x-rays. Sometimes you have a patient, 69 years old, severe bilateral knee pain, standing x-rays, looking pretty good. Dr. Asrani, I mean, I've taken you through what you see on standing x-rays, and you look at this, pretty good. If you look at this here, the space here, ostrified, very small, very small ostrified medially. What should be offered? Looks like a normal x-ray. Patients come to me, I say, goli denge, ye karenge, wo karenge. Patient says, I'm miserable. Is a total knee the correct indication or is it an overkill? That's where decision making is based on your brains, your heart, your mind, your experience. You look at the kind of knee this lady had. This was the cartilage. There's no way that she will not get pain from this cartilage. Eroded, ebernated. So this was the right offer that I could make for her. She needed the knee replacement. This was a clinical decision. And there she is. Immediately after surgery, same day, same time, you can see that there are these drains sticking out. That's why you can see those pipes. Within two hours of the surgery, she was in a position to walk. When all is not lost, revision is still an option. Let's just hope we can fix the damage done also. We will do that yeah. too. <laughs> and we can fix the damage done. You have patients who've had knee replacements they may, after that, have had a problem. We can revise it, give him a standard knee. These are various ways of doing the revisions, and all is not lost when they have had a knee replacement, including infections. Primary hip arthroplasty, can these patients sit? And the answer is yes, they can sit on the floor. And we've published this, by the way. And let me take you through how this is possible. Patient with a fracture neck femur, you've seen this again and again. I did a total hip for him. The drain's in place and soon after surgery, he's able to sit. He can sit on his knees, he can draw his legs up, back to normal function. Pandit Ravi Shankar, sitting like this to play the sitar. Why do I bring Ravi Shankar to this discussion? This is a gentleman, he's a doctor. You can't recognize his face now. But 16 years ago, he wanted to sit like that. He had hip arthritis. He could not find a surgeon who could offer him this position. So he elected to go to Kolkata for this surgery so that he would have this movement possible so that he could play the sitar. Now, unfortunately, 16 years ago, the people he talked to, he's a doctor, suggested to him, etc. And he decided, leave everything aside, he would go to Kolkata and get this done. 16 years down the line or so, 2006, he needed to have a revision. This is what I did for the right side. How did we do this? Well, the technique was that we brought the angle down of the cup. We gave him a posterior cover and we used a large head. The important thing was to use a large head. Straight after surgery, he's able to do this. He sent me a picture from his home. So it is possible for us in Bombay. Why should someone go to Kolkata? to do this kind of surgery. 
This gentleman, I took his permission to show you this. He is the chief priest at Jagannath Puri. His requirement was that he would cease to be the chief priest at Jagannath Puri if he was unable to sit on the floor to do his daily puja. He came for his first surgery. I offered him this joint. By the time he came for his second surgery, this joint, the company had stopped selling. Dipui had stopped selling this joint. He said, Saab, agar wo joint nahi hai, shall I go somewhere else? I can travel abroad. We have a sansta which will support me. I said, not necessary. This joint, again a large head, but not as large as this. With this thing turned, and there, after the surgery, he is sitting here comfortably, sitting on the floor with his hip replacement. So earlier I showed you a lady with a knee replacement sitting on the floor. That was the video. Here we have the chief priest of Jagannath Puri sitting on the floor because otherwise he would have technically lost his job. So it's, prop it's possible with the newer technology for us to give them what they need, normal range of movements. So yet another younger lady, two years after a total hip replacement, she came to me just after she got married, she brought Mithai. So I asked her, are you okay? She said, ah, ah, our husband ko malum hai. And ye sab mein kar leti hon. So I took the opportunity to take her picture to show you that after a hip replacement, it's possible to get all movements. Oh my God, God, this is, this a, is a fact. fact. <laughs> this is a fact, gentlemen, ladies. Complex and revision cases also are possible to do. Some of these we could not do many, many years ago. And let me take you through one or two of them. These are cases that would have been impossible to treat earlier. Kharaab ho gaya, abhi bed par pade rao. Joint infections, not that I like to do them, but it's possible for us to treat these kind of joint infections also. So this is a patient who had so, so this is a patient who had this as the problem earlier for which this was done. This got infected. Thereafter, I went and I, he came to me, then I put him a spacer. I put in a spacer, which is called an antibiotic spacer. And then from this, I then revised it to this. Different types of screws, different screws. So this is a range of movement at the end of three months. This was what, was, what happened. <laughs> Yet another patient who had a DHS, successful I think, but got infected at some stage. We took this out. You will notice this screw is angled. This is the hole that is angled. So this is the same case. Put in a s antibiotic spacer, revised it to this. This is the patient walking after the revision. The patient expectations of extreme motions we have seen, active lifestyle, high demands. The other requirement is fast track surgery. Who has time nowadays? You, he wants, the patient wants to come in, get operated and go back home quickly. Particularly in COVID time, no one wants to stay in the hospital. Well, there are lots of things we do to achieve this. It's multimodal, we do adductor canal blocks, we do periarticular infiltration, I use intravenous steroids. In the surgical technique, we do certain things for knees, we reduce the blood, blood loss by giving periarticular infiltration and tranamixic acid. And post-op, you have compression devices, bruprenorphin patch, etc., which helps patient mobilize the same day, routinely. I mean, you can see the catheter is still in, etc. That means it's within two hours, because after the third hour, I take it off. 
So we are able to get these patients discharged in three days. How do, I, how do you time three days? Well, the insurance company needs to know how many days, right? So the first night of surgery, before surgery, admission, one day. Second is the day of surgery, day two. Now, if you were in America, you might want to just send them out of the hospital because they go to facilities where they can be looked after. But here, they have to go back home. So day two is the day of surgery. When I showed you that they were already walking within two hours. Day three for them to get reasonably comfortable and confident. They've done staircase, they've walked around, they've gone to the toilet. If they can go to the toilet and sit, if they've taken one or two steps, you can be jao there, one or two steps, even on their first floor, ground floor of flats and houses. If they are able to do that, that's three days, then depending on patient to patient, one extra day maybe, but we can, you know, look at them going home very, very fast nowadays. We, these are the booklets that I give patients when they come to me. So they need to be educated. Their family needs to be educated. Their children living abroad need to be educated. So they need to have that. So we give our patients these booklets well, when they come for a consultation. We teach them these exercises in my clinic and then we give them this handout. These are the exercises you need to do for knees. These are the exercises you need to do for hips. And <clears throat> it's there in this booklet as well. As I said, patients can mobilize very fast. We, we give them physiotherapy. We give them periarticular infiltration, which is during the surgery, we give them lignocaine, etc. And, well, this is the adductor canal block is done under ultrasound guidance. So you block only the sensory nerves. That also helps. You give them cold compress, ice packs. I give all my patients DVD socks and compression devices. And most of my patients, 99% of my patients, I do this kind of suturing, which makes them very comfortable because they don't need to come back to me for suture removal. I mean, they come back to show me their scar, of course, but there are no stitches to be taken out, no staples to be taken out, no apprehension So we published this in JCOT, Concealed Cosmetic Closure and Total Knee Replacement Surgery. And longevity of the implants is possible because of the materials. This black thing that you can see is auxinium, the innovative bearing materials. This plastic is highly cross-linked, and I'll talk to you about both, both of these right away. When you have metal on polyethylene, you do get wear and osteolysis. When you have ceramic, you get wear and osteolysis, but you can get a sound sometimes. But ceramic is really good. Ceramic ball bearings are the ball bearings that they use in Rolls Royce cars. So they will use metallic ball bearings in cars like the Mercedes, the Audi. But in the Rolls Royce, they will use ceramic. So it's really very hard. It is not like a cup or a saucer, but it's highly the fourth generation of ceramic. So this is extremely good. Ceramic on ceramic causes squeaking and sometimes you can get a break. That's a little bit of an issue. So metal on metal had come into vogue and I did hundreds of these cases, but there was this problem of ARMD and metallosis. So what we now, what I use is that black stuff, auxinium, which is metal where the surface is coated or surface is changed to be ceramicized. So I have the advantage of metal and I have the advantage of ceramic and it articulates against highly cross-linked polyethylene and the wear is extremely low because of the cross linkages, etc. And therefore, this kind of thing lasts you, I hope, a lifetime. And here is the auxinium. These are these metal, these black things. There's no chance of a fracture. There's no chance of a metal allergy and so on and so forth. Now, this has not come as a great contrast, but this is the auxinium. The material is proprietary to Smith and Nephew. But that's not why I'm saying it. 
I'm saying that you use the right material. You can see the scoring over here of chromium cobalt. Whereas this, and this costs 5,000 rupees more than this. So this is what I use. The material is superior and therefore we hope it will last longer. Their simulation on machines suggests that it will last you for 30 years. So the longevity of the joint is there. There are other knees called the gold knee, which is harder than chromium cobalt. I don't particularly use this, but it's there. So it's not that any patient who goes only to Sanjay Garwala will get a knee that will last longer. These are the other knees, which will also last longer. Friction is less than the chromium cobalt and so on and so forth. These are different materials which are available. So this is where technology has stepped in, that the materials are superior. We have different technologies which we can use. This is a dual mobility hip, which I use in certain primary cases of uh, fracture neck femurs, in certain revision cases, and it moves, as you will see in this, in two planes, on two articulations. So that's what we do. We do it for fracture neck femurs, and I grew up putting Austin Moores and Dr. Asrani and all of you will remember that this was being used. Thompson's was cemented, whereas Austin Moore was not cemented. Then came the bipolar, which I use very infrequently now. The conventional THR, I showed you a case where that gentleman was doing, sitting like namaz. The dual mobility, which I just showed you in the last slide. And then, of course, these kind of hips, which we do as well. All fractures don't need to have a joint replacement, even though I am a joint replacement surgeon, I'm also a fracture surgeon. Now, intertrochanteric fracture femur came to me for a joint replacement because he was told that otherwise he'd be lying in bed for three months. Well, there he is, smiling on the right-hand side. Day one of surgery, he's able to walk like this. Why should he have a joint replacement? A good fixation is what he needed. And the end of three months, this is how he was doing extremely well. So just because I'm a joint replacement surgeon doesn't mean I do only joint replacements. As I told you for the knees, I take a decision based on requirements. There are newer nails available which help earlier mobilization. They are more expensive, but you know, if the patient can afford it, and if the patient opts to have it, I have newer nails to offer. This particular nail costs 70,000 rupees. But this is what I can offer the patient after that kind of surgery. Newer tools, computer navigation, you all have heard about it. It's probably a good tool. Should it avoids component malpositioning. It gives you balanced knees. I had this 10 years. 10 years ago, it came for one crore. I shared the machine with the neurosurgeons because I could not justify to the hospital that I'd be able to recover. I did it for 30 cases. Each patient had to pay at that time one and a half lakh rupees more. I got 30 patients. It took me one and a half hours more to do it. And after the first 30 cases, I stopped using it. Now, if I had bought it myself, I would need to recover the money. I would justify it to myself and to others that the computer navigation is better. Here's a 219-ka paper, which shows that there is no better functional outcome as compared to the conventional technique. Now, it's possible that you will get robotics, you will get new handheld devices. You will get all this in future, which will make it better for the patient if it is better for the patient and if i so decide i will start using it robotics hey i do a damn good job you just saw what kind of work i do do i need it well again if it offers me more for my patients i'm sure hindujas can afford to buy it for me in future will there be 3d printing and i think that's certainly a possibility 
I mean, the very fact that you can have cars which don't need diesel and petrol and can only do batteries, I'm sure they can do 3D printing for replacements and match it to look like, feel like the real anatomical knee or the hip. Okay, start. That's, that's the right way so to do it. So probably that's the right way to do it. These are some of my patients, happy I hope. And the take home message I have at one hour is fast track recovery patient walks in the same day. That's because of new technology. We discharge in, I can discharge them in two days. I can get them admitted on the day of surgery and discharge them same day. I don't want to do it. Newer implants, the survivorship of these implants 30 years. Extreme range of motions and active lifestyles. I've shown you that with bisphosphonates, I've shown you that with knees, I've shown you that with hips. The future is now, robotics and 3D printing, we are still to reach there, but that's where we are reaching. That is what I'll speak to you one of these days tomorrow. We can actually replace that which is lost. You remember this from Star Wars, he cut off his hand and they showed you this, that this is what will happen. So this is the future. So join me in the future, but join me in the present. So Dr. Asrani, any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you very much. So I have some questions. So I'll stop share here. There we are. Dr. Shaila Ansari has asked two questions. Okay. Can you please elaborate on or name the exercises on land or aquatic base? Secondly, up to what grade of OA are they to be advised? And they will benefit. Okay. <clears throat> so let me show you on a model. Okay, there we have a model. I have a patient who is sitting and he needs to stand. He needs to therefore use the hip movements, the hip muscles, and also simultaneously needs to use the quadriceps here. Because if he's standing, he has to do that. The hip muscles are at the back, the gluteal. So these muscles are exercised if you do something like this. And these muscles are exercised if you're doing swimming. Whereas this would be on a bed, swimming would give him a feedback because they would be able to do this. If you were to exercise your quadriceps, you need to be able to straighten your leg. The correct? Yeah, there. You would be able to straighten your leg. To do this, you need to do anti-gravity. Just tightening your muscles is isometric. Taking a one kilo weight around your knee and then lifting it is isometric. So these are quadriceps exercises. If the patient is standing, and so that the patient doesn't tilt, the patient needs to do abduction exercises. These are best done against gravity lifting the leg or if that's very difficult in the beginning you do it standing like kutte ki chal hoti na kutta dan susu by lifting the leg so that's the way you do it you lift the leg so that these muscles allow you to control your hip so i think in a nutshell these are the exercises that i would recommend and they are there in the handouts that i give patients for that the second question was at what at Till what stage can you do the exercises? Till the stage that is not hurting. Till the stage that it is not hurting is when you would do these exercises. Okay. Second question is, can high flex be used for revision TKR in a 70-year female TKR done five years ago, painful knee? Advise revision. So once you do a revision, there are more tissues which are cut and high flex is not done. It's a very good question. High flex is not done. You need more stability. 
in a revision. So high flex is not done for revision. I will incorporate that next time you ask me to talk on this. Then this question, I don't know you like to answer or not. How much it cost operation and total cost five days, knee or hip operation? Okay. So it's not difficult to answer that. The cost of the joint for knees is regulated by the government. That comes to 75 to 85, depending on which model you use. Along with that, you use cement. So 75 to 85 is what you need for the knee. Hips, the type that I use, which I showed you with ceramic, the auxinium, the larger heads, etc., they are in the vicinity of 1,20,000 to 1,55,000. So the hips are currently a little more expensive, maybe because they're not regulated. But these are the hips that give you the kind of functions I showed you. Put that aside. Second thing is theater charges. That roughly is 10,000 rupees an hour. I manage in two hours, but generally two hours, three hours lagta hai for one case. It's like taking a flight from Bombay to Delhi. I mean, the flight itself is one and a half hours, but you know, you need to factor in three hours. So that's about 10,000 rupees an hour. And clearly, in hospitals like Hinduja, the rates are dependent on which class of admission you come in. General ward, which is called uh, median, second class, which is sharing, and the single rooms. The single rooms and the sharing rooms subsidize the other classes. The actual cost for a bed in our hospital, we've worked out, is around 8,000 rupees. Khana, Pina, Rena, the AC, the ward, ward staff, the nurses, the cleanliness, all that, it, it, the costing is about 8,000 rupees. It is only in the median class that we really are around 8,000 rupees in the bed charge. Whereas in the general ward, it's 6,000 or 5,000 nowadays. It used to be 100 and 150, but over the 35 years, in, inflation has really uh, taken its toll. But even whatever we are charging now in the general ward is a subsidy based on what charges we get in the second class and the first class patients. So you take that aside. Five days stay into the number of days. The rest is goli dawai pani. 20,000 to aap mota moti rakh lein uska. 20,000 for some of the tests, if you do them with us, you can, you know, a lot of times the people do them elsewhere. But after all, those tests are for the safety of the patient. So we have to weigh that. Say they are x-rays, they're standing x-rays, they're scanogram. Once in a while, they'll need chest CT, etc. They'll need blood tests, they'll need an ECG, 2D echo. Lots of little tests are required. Then there is surgeon's charges, anesthesia charges. Anesthesia is one third the surgeon charges. Now the surgeon charges in general ward are subsidized. So just like in any other thing, and we cannot as a hospital afford to price ourselves out of the market. So I can't say that general ward is 10 lakh rupees. In general ward, 3.5 lakh rupees to 4 lakh rupees, depending on which implant we are using. The same sort of thing in the sharing would be a lakh rupees more. And if we were in a single room, and single room also we have different, different uh, types of single room, it will be another lakh more than that. So it gives you a little rough idea and all rates at Hinduja Hospital etc are printed. So it is not that there is any under the table issue etc. These are all shared with every patient when they come. They are given a choice. In post-surgical patients with low bone density, how important is it to address osteosarcopenia and not just osteopenia or osteoporosis? So osteosarcopenia is when the muscles and the bones are involved and osteopenia is when the bones are involved. So if you look at what we were talking about earlier, I showed you the humerus of a person who had the throwing arm and the non-throwing arm. So in the throwing arm, the, the bone was stronger. Same way, the muscles are stronger when you have degree of activity. And I mentioned in the talk 
that if you have disuse atrophy, the bones become softer, but even the muscles become weaker. Clearly at that stage, if the muscles are weak, you need exercises and you might need decadurable type injections over a period of time. The bones themselves will also need to be addressed. And sometimes in these patients who have osteoporotic bones, you can't just put a non-cemented, you need to put a cemented. So cemented joints we do very often in hips for patients who are a little less strong. So we do cemented total hip replacements there. And we need to address it. I mean, osteopenia will need to address the bone alone. In osteosarcopenia, we'll have to address the muscles and the bones. Thank you. Do you do both knee replacements and the same sitting? Yes. So we have shown, in fact, in our own paper, if you just put a bilateral knee replacement and agarwala, we published that it's safe to do. After the age of 75, we feel that that is not safe. That is based on a whole lot of criteria, which are uh, heart, etc. There are multiple papers from multiple places, some which say it's good to do, some which say it's bad to do. But we have actually published in the journal of uh, JCOT uh, that it is safe to do, and we've given our series of 350 cases. Role of chondroitin, glucosamine, dynserin, and how long one can take them? So these are the pharmaceutical agents. Uh, let me just simplify it for you. Chondroitin is cartilage extract, just as is glucosamine. So if you take a protein by mouth, for your body to recognize that this protein is meant for the cartilage may be difficult. I mean, it address not come to that address. That protein is protein here. So taking these particular proteins, if they reach the bloodstream and if they reach the area of the cartilage, the cartilage finds that it is our So just to simplify it, it is not as simple as that. The diacerin actually is the, the drug which will direct this particular protein to go towards that cartilage area. Now diacerin causes pink color urine. You need to warn your patient that we are Aapki pink urine aayegi, aap don't think that this is bleeding. You know, suddenly they'll think, hey, yeah, bleeding ho gaya. they'll come back to you, ki, yaar, kidney is bleeding. So, now the other part of the question was, how long do you give it? If you give it for more than, if you give it for six weeks and the patient is not getting any symptom relief, it's useless. There's no point flogging a dead horse. But at six weeks, if you feel that the patient says, sahab, abhi thoda to achcha lag raha hai. Give it for another six weeks and stop it. You can't give it lifelong. We don't really, I don't think there are any studies which say ek saal diya, do saal diya. I think six weeks is what I use. I give it for six weeks and the patient comes back for a follow-up if they're feeling good. Another six weeks and then we stop it. But in early stages, I think it helps. In early stages, it helps. In late stages, when they're really far gone, like some of the x-rays I showed you earlier, then you can't expect the drug to act because you already have changes which are physical changes in the joint. It can't work. Thank you. Role of stem cell therapy in a young AVN occurred in a post-traumatic fracture in a female 20-year-old patient. So at present, I don't think there's any place for stem cells, frankly. I've tried them because when I was doing my AVN work, Clearly, I was looking at other possibilities, other modalities, and the people who have these stem cells came to meet me. It doesn't work at all at present. In the future, it will, but it needs to get further refined. 20 years ago, if I had told you, Chandar, yeah, I'm buying a car which is battery operated. Now, with the technology that has changed, we're all talking about in the next five years, next 10 years, we'll only have battery cars. So technology is changing for the better. Stem cells is the future, just like I showed you 3D printing, that is the future. But at present, we still don't have enough technology to say that stem cells will work. Particularly once you have physical changes, the bone has collapsed, 
you can't put stem cells and it will grow back to make the uh, head big again. You put stem cells in a thing which is, um, which is go showing osteolytic area. Does that work? Well, A, I've shown you that in six weeks I can give you bisphosphonates. You start getting better. I've shown you in three years bisphosphonates have worked. Should I be subjecting this patient to a surgical procedure when I have excellent drugs? I mean, if you have excellent drugs in your facility to give a patient, why should you do surgery? So that is why we need to select our cases. I don't offer stem cell surgery to anyone. Zero. Because I find that with my medical treatment that I am giving, they do extremely well. And at this point in time, in the early stages, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I tried these stem cells, they didn't work at all. Not at all. And nothing has changed since then in terms of stem cell biology that I am aware of. Maybe in the future. But there's no way that a stem cell will recreate a bone. Yes, possible that these areas which are soft can become stronger with stem cells. But why do surgery when I can achieve the same thing with medicines which I showed you? Rule of platelet-rich plasma. Same thing. Same At this thing. stage, doesn't work. Does not work. Same, exactly the same thing. Platelet-rich plasma is another form of stem cell, shall I put it. At present, doesn't work. You used platelet-rich plasma for tennis elbow. Steroid works better than that. I've tried it, been there, done that. Are post-surgery rehabilitation programs very extensive? Generally not, not unless you're talking of osteosarcopenia. No, it's not. The patient I operated yesterday was walking yesterday and walking much better today. Today he's talking about going and playing golf with me. I said, I'm going to learn how your views on cartilage transfer? So, I think cartilage transfer has a place in very young people. And I am not a specialist in trans cartilage transplant. I have had patients, then I get my colleague to do the arthroscopy, harvest the cartilage, then we grow the cartilage. And we're talking of patients who are type of 16 years old, 17 years old, who had a traumatic removal of the, uh, have a, had a traumatic incidence and the cartilage has come off. And I get my colleague then to harvest it. It gets harvested by the same people who make these kind of stem cells. They bring it back and then he implants it. I stand around uh, because I don't think I have that expertise, enough expertise to be able to do it. And we do about, I see about one case a year. We've been doing it for the last six, seven years. So six cases in all, not more than that. Out of which, the usual story, half have done well, half have not. So I'm not very sure about it. But you can't do cartilage transplant, you can't do stem cells, you can't do platelet which for people who have degenerate knees or degenerate hips or they have AVN. It doesn't work. Are bifosphonates uh, safe for all age groups? So we've used bisphosphonates as I showed you in that young child who had ALL and I've used bisphosphonates for the older person. I've used bisphosphonates in people who are childbearing but we don't know enough about bisphosphonates for birth. So we, we, we tell them that we don't know so please don't conceive during the time that you're taking uh, bisphosphonates. We have no information. Bisphosphonates have been described worldwide for osteoporosis which generally happens in older people. So when we give it in younger people who are childbearing age women, they are told that no, please, please don't get pregnant. I mean, that's written in the notes. It's written on their prescription. This concept of knee, belt or braces, are they any good? Yes, they are. So if we were to remember my slide where I showed you that instead of a straight leg, someone has a bent leg. Hmm. If you can get a suitable belt, which will do this, 
If it's a severe case, you have to do the osteotomy that I showed you. But if you can get a suitable belt which does this, it's called an offloader splint. And I use this all the time. Uh, the good offloaders come for eight, nine thousand rupees. They need to use it only when they are walking. So I tell them, the, just when you wear your sh slippers or shoes to go out, that is the time you wear the offloader also. It works if you have selected the case. If it works and the patient is getting tired of using an offloader, that's the kind of patient you will order an osteotomy. Okay. You said outcome of TKR is not so good in morbidly obese, but little more light on this, how good or how bad it is as compared to other patients. So obesity is, you know, it's, uh, those, BMI you know, above 35. Yeah. So, so inside of 30, everything happens quite nicely. You don't need to say, it will tell the patient, come kar ke ao. If you're morbidly obese, the issues are, the joints are made for, say, someone who's 75 kilos. Those are the normal sort of joints, 75, 85, 90 kilos kaj person. If the same joint, because the bone structure is small, you use in someone who is 135 or 145 kilos, clearly that joint won't last as long. Doing the surgery, you will have to make a long scar. The healing of that wound will be compromised. Healing of wound compromise means slow healing. Healing of wound being compromised means there's risk of infection. And a joint that will not last long enough, the patient will come back after three years or four years or five years and say, Zahav ne kiya hai, kara ho gaya. Tis saal ki baat kar rahe the. Zahav kara ho gaya jaldi se. Not your fault. The fault is the patient dynamics. So, not a great idea. For, now, these are the kind of patients I would send to our colleagues who do bariatric surgery. I must admit, I tell them this, I give them my diet charts, etc. No one loses weight. They just go to another doctor. No one goes for, I have not had a single patient who's gone to a bariatric surgeon and come back, ki ab hamara vajan kam ho gaya, ab surgery kariye. But at least I have to offer them that because I genuinely feel that it's the right thing to do. Some comment on the how young a patient can be subjected to knee replacement even if he or she has stage 3 osteoarthritis. So, this was a very, very valid question when knee joints would last 6, 7, 8 years. About 30 years ago when I returned from, from England, 35 years ago, very valid question and we said delay it, delay it. Delay it. Now when you have joints which will last you 30 years, if the person has severe osteoarthritis or severe arthritis from an old trauma and something and, and is crippled, should I tell him wait 30 years, continue to be crippled and then I will do a knee replacement or a hip replacement for that matter? The answer is no. At a younger age, if the person is crippled, you want him to have a quality of life. And that's what hips and knees replacements are for, quality of life. So if you want to offer him a quality of life, you offer it early, you offer him a joint which has longevity of 30 years, 25, 30 years, and at which stage, as I've shown you in my presentation, it is possible to do a revision. You can do revisions and you have to plan for the revision, meaning you don't take out too much bone, you ensure that you're conservative in amount you're reaming, and this is all part of the technique that one uses in these modern day surgical procedures. When I studied uh, doing hip replacements in England, we used to do Charlie hips, which are great hips, cementing it, removing the cancellous bone. Now we're very conservative about the bone being removed, in spite of which we get a very good fix. So, a short answer to the, law, to the question that was asked, it is possible to do this in an early stage if a patient is crippled, and I do it all the time for hips, because I have this uh, certain number of cohort of patients who come to me with AVN, when they don't do well, or they're in very advanced stages of AVN, and arthritic, that's a stage four AVN, then that's the thing to do for them, so they can get back to life. Any upward age restriction? I know people have got done at 80 years of 80 age also. So, 
let me uh, explain this by if I had a patient who was 95 years old with a fractured neck femur, would I tell this patient that now you are studying, you will die, you will die, you will die, or should I tell him you need a hip replacement? I think he needs a hip replacement because such a patient at 95 cannot really be told ki aisa mat karna, aise mat baitna, niche mat baita jana, by mistake to dislocate ho jayega. So you give him a hip which is secure. The dual mobility hip is what I would do at 95. I would give him a, knee, a hip replacement which is a dual mobility. In the knee, if a patient is mentally sound, very active, he needs to have a knee replacement. If they are willing, is it riskier? Of course it's riskier. I mean, any surgery that you do on a 20-year-old is less risk than someone who is 80 years old. Any surgery that I do in an 80-year-old is less risk than someone who is 95, clearly. But if you're talking of quality of life, I think it's worth taking a chance. If all people who are in that cohort, in that bubble, are aware of it, now, someone who is 80, uh, who's 95 years old, his children will be like me, 65 years old. They have to agree that you can do it, that you can do it. The Babu Ji is saying the right thing. So, it's a lot of work to do it. There is a Of course, there is a risk yet. So, they have to be all ready for it. And that also, we don't just jump in to do it and take a risk. When you and I take a plane, before the plane takes off, the air hostess says, if there is an emergency, you take this door and you take this door, Nietzsche's a light aayegi. She is telling you that in taking a flight, there is a risk. Now, second thing, would you and I be comfortable taking Bangladesh Biman for a flight? We say, no, yaar. Emirates hoega to achcha hai. Air India hoega to achcha hai. So, when you talk of risks, it's couched with certain degree of sense certain th degree of requirement. Third thing, when a patient opts to have surgery at that late stage, there will be multiple comorbidities. If the comorbidities are not well controlled, there's no question of me saying, ah, kara lo yaar. Dekh lenge, dekh lenge kya hai. I mean, there are comorbidities of, of diabetes which people like you control extremely well. Comorbidities of hypertension which people like you control extremely well. If those kind of comorbidities are well controlled and then the, in spite of all that, the heart is okay as far as we can tell, then the risks have been mitigated and brought down. But if at that age you have someone who's got uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, so much that's not controlled, forget trying to get the heart assessed. That patient cannot be taken up for surgery clearly. So Sanjay, people have been giving you rave comments. Very nice okay. webinar. Lot of updating. Okay. I'm pleased so to... I'll ask you a question now. Sure. I'll ask your permission. Can we put up this video on YouTube? Go ahead and do it. If someone learns from it, I'm delighted. I'm delighted. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for agreeing to come here and really enlightening us. Well, Thank I'm you very, very much. Pleased. God I'm bless very you. Pleased you called me, and I hope that the people who were there for this. No, no, it's been very, very helpful. Even like, even I can say, and the way people are talking. Good. Yeah, I yeah. will send you the chat of what the comments have come. Send me those. I would like yeah. to read through them. Yeah. The very. I was delighted to be here, and thank you for giving me this platform. Thank you very much. We will trouble you again if you want to learn something more. Agarwal classes, ideal for scholars. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay. Chai okay, chai. bye. Take care. Thank you all yeah, for listening. Take care, yeah. Okay. Bye.